have some charge uh, for these meetings. We have, haven't been charged to get anything at all and we need to cover our expenses. So beginning next year, we're going to charge $5 uh, entry fee for each of the museum uh, of, of these uh, uh, events uh, there. And I believe we're going to have six next year. Isn't that right? That's what we decided. If, if the schedule doesn't uh, uh, change. Uh, this evening, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Richard Campbell, who will uh, present our uh, speaker. I'm not going to say what I said last week. But last week, I said I'm going to, we're going to have a joker presenting a joker. But <laughs> Richard? Good evening. Yeah. Uh, this is my second introduction in a row, and I'm very pleased that I'm going to introduce a more legitimate speaker this time. <laughs> how, how we feel about someone has a great deal to do with, with how they treat us, how they treat the, my friends, and how they treat my loved ones. And our speaker tonight has, has been a dear to me for, well, she's not very old, so it couldn't have been very long, but everybody that knows her, every friend that knows this lady loves her. I mean, it's just a fact. It admires her. And no one could have been any nicer to my mother, uh, treated her much like she were her own mother. And that certainly endears one to someone and our speaker such a person tonight. Uh, I'd like to tell you she was born at a very early age. <laughs> and uh, one of her former friends told me uh, that she was born in Hainsville. Is that correct? Born in Hainsville. And it was a chilly night and had to wrap the lass up. And her dad and another fellow apparently brought her home. Some of you played with folks by the other this story. It was very telling. And they brought her home. And of course, it was so chilly, they really had to kind of wrapped up. And got home and realized all the way home, they'd been holding her upside down. <laughs> <laughs> so if she says anything that sounds like calling a brother on you, you understand what it the last was educated in Clayton Parish and almost everywhere else. She holds more degrees than a thermometer, I think. She has uh, BAs and BSs and MSs, and she's a wonderful liberal arts person, and she's kind of over to the science side. She's, some of you know her as a, an assistant or adjunct pro professor at Dipsy. Uh, but to the, oh, another little tidbit out of her past, uh, You'll see once she gets up here, she's a rather lovely lass. Uh, she was in the Miss Louisiana pageant. How about that? Uh -huh. And it was a unanimous vote that she was most congenial. I mean, every single person that voted on her, I think about that now.
since we mentioned the caddies, let's take a side trip and speculate about what life might have been like living in a log cabin. The common practice was for settlers to build a single room cabin and later expand the house by building another room to the side and joining the two rooms by a central hallway, giving rise to the dog trot style house that's so characteristic of our region. <coughs> We have a small cabin in Ford Museum. It measures only 15 feet by 18 feet. And yet, a dozen or so people lived in this tiny house at the same time. You could wonder why they didn't all turn out to be criminals, given what sociologists have told us about the effects of overcrowding. <laughs> However, the conditions of frontier life were different, and their attitudes were different. And certainly, the social philosophy of the people living in the cabin was different. These early settlers came from large families who had been reared in small dwellings. For the most part, they were the English and Scots Irish descent, and they were accustomed to crowded houses. Before the days of mechanized farming, it was advantageous to have a large family because extra farm hands enhanced one's chances of succeeding and also for having someone to take care of you in your old age. So let's look at how the people in the cabin met their needs for furniture, for instance. Any man who could build his own house could also make his own bed. Using an ax, an auger, and a chisel, he could cut down a tree, make the posts and rails and the headboard, and make a rope bed. Beds were highly prized possessions in the old days, and they figured prominently in the estate inventories of men and women of the 19th century. Other furniture included ladder back chairs, blanket chests, stools, benches, and a table for preparing food and for dining. Chairs were usually made of oak or hickory or a combination of the two. The very best chairs had posts made of green wood which shrank while drying and held the dry rails and braces tightly in place. Benches and stools were sometimes made of boards, but more often, benches were made from half hewn logs fitted with stout legs drawn into auger holes. Closets were non existent in the log cabin, so the family's clothes were usually hung on pegs, which had been driven into the auger holes and walls. Before the farm was very well established, mattresses would be filled with hay or corn shucks. Later on, if the family had acquired a flock of geese, the geese could be plucked for down, which would provide a warmer and more comfortable mattress. As soon as possible, the farmer obtained a few sheep to provide the wool, which was woven into the beautiful oak shop coverlets, which gave color to the room. The threads were dyed before being woven. The women obtained various shades of yellow using golden rod and onion skins. The brown color came from walnut hulls. Red came from coke berries. And the blue color came from indigo, which had to be store bought. Gardening was usually the woman's responsibility. When a woman married and went off with her husband, part of her belongings included seeds. The variety was limited, but still there was enough to provide some interest. There would be corn and squash, turnips, pumpkins, peas, muskmelons, beets, carrots, and cabbage. 
although not raised for food, gourd vines were present in this garden because the gourds made good bowls and dippers, and also banjos and birdhouses, especially for purple martins. The purple martin is a native bird that's instinctively hostile to crows and hawks. So if one could succeed in getting a colony of purple martins to own that near his house, he could protect both his garden and his chicken yard. Seeds and cuttings for flower gardens were also prized. Flowering shrubs, <coughs> such as crape myrtle and forsythia, were brought in, and some of these may still be found growing in old house plants. I know you know that the way to identify an old house site is to come across a field of daffodils growing in the spring and great big shade trees. The house doesn't have to be there, but almost for sure that's an old house site. The fire in the cabin burned day and night year round, and everyone, young and old, learned to build and maintain a fire. There were fires for cooking, fires for heating, and fires for giving light. The type of wood used made a difference. Most firemakers preferred hickory because it burned longer and put out more heat per cubic foot. Ash was also a favorite because it would burn green. Pine was sometimes used as pine wood, but more often it was used as candy. Lighter wood from pine stumps or knots from fallen trees were kept by the fire so that when more light was needed, a knot could be thrown onto the coals to give a bright flame which lit up the room. It would be a mistake to romanticize their lives. Space was certainly limited, and living conditions were different. Probably the main distinction of living in the log cabin was the lack of privacy. However, standards of modesty on the frontier were entirely different from what they are today, now that we Americans are so affluent that each of us can have his own room. This was the era when five or six men, all total strangers, might share a boarding house bed and think nothing about it. Our ancestors in the log cabin were either crowded or cozy, depending on your interpretation. <coughs> Actually, it was an education in life. At night, the men and older boys might bring in news from a nearby settlement. The old people might tell an incident from long ago, or tell stories, or read from the Bible. They communicate. Back to the early settlers of Clayton Parish. The John Merle family arrived in the area that would become Clayton Parish in June 1818. The following winter, a number of immigrants settled in the area around Flat Lake Bayou. Flat Lake is on what is now the western edge of Clayton Parish. Some of their family names were Ryder, Wood, Holcomb, Browns, Eggs, Bell, and Drew. The Drew name is illustrious. New Drew was the ancestor who first settled at Flat Lake and tried farming. But he then moved two miles south of present-day Minden where he built a sawmill at the grist mill on Cooley Creek, where it flows into Dorchit. Drew sold lots during the 1830s and promoted the growth of a village there. The village would become known as Overton. Overton became an important port town on the Dorchit. As you know, Dorchi flows into Lake Bistino, which flows into the Red River, which flows into the Mississippi River, 
and takes one to New Orleans, which was the major trade center of the day. During the high water months of the year, it was possible for a shallow draft steamboat to reach Overton and offload supplies and offload cotton bales to be taken to the cotton factories in New Orleans. From 1836 to 1846, Overton also served as the parish seat of Old Clover. <clears throat> when I first came home and began learning local history, I couldn't <coughs> imagine how a steamboat could travel up the door cheat. But there's an explanation. There was a raft, a big log jam, in the Red River proper. And it stopped up the main channel of the river, which forced water into the side streams, like Long Bayou and Bayou Pierre. And it raised the level of water in Dorchi, it raised the level of water in this snow. And that's why a steamboat could make it up the Dorchi to Overton. Once the raft was removed, the water flowed down the main channel of the river, and these side streams either dried up or became much smaller. <clears throat> Another group of families who came very early were German families who had essentially been shipwrecked around 1820 near Walton Bayou. When they heard about the destitute condition of these people, Merle and two of his neighbors went to get them. He brought them back. Each of the German families contracted to live with a settlement family for two years for room and board, and to learn how to make a living in the new country. The Miller name is a prominent name among these people. They worked out their contracts, established their own homes in the area, and many of their descendants are still with us. The John Merle home served as the first for a number of things in Old Claver Parish. In the years before Claiborne was created out of Old Natchitoches, it served as the first church, which was a Baptist denomination, in 1822. It served as the first school. Noel hired John Connolly to teach for $15 a month. And it also served as the first post office in 1823. Merle himself was the postmaster. When Claiborne Parish was carved out of Old Natchitoches Parish in 1828, the Merle Hall served as the de facto courthouse until the police jury of the new parish selected the home of Samuel Russell in the Russellville community to be the official seat of government. Old Russellville is slightly less than a mile northeast of present-day Athens. Russellville remained the parish city until 1836. By that time, the population center had shifted westward, leading to the reestablishment of the parish city at Overton, then a thriving port town on the Dorchy. The location proved to be unhelpful, however. Mosquitoes again, I gathered. However, so, in 1846, the seat of government was moved to Old Athens. It remained there till the night of November 6, 1849, when the court building burned, destroying all the public records. That's actually tragic. The fire that destroyed the courthouse at Old Athens was thought to be of incendiary origin. Arson. The suspicion becomes more meaningful when one learns that just two months before the fire, the parish at Claiborne had obtained a land patent from the U.S. 
for 120 acres of land on which subsequently were located the parish seat and the town of Homer. Actually, the sale of town lots had already begun around the square, and there was a great big empty space left in the center, just the right size for a courthouse. <laughs> So the events surrounding the burning of the courthouse at Old Athens and the creation of the town of Homer are full of unsolved mysteries. And generally, it's a story that's been suppressed. After the burning of the courthouse at Old Athens, the police jury acted to move the parish seat to Homer, where it's still maintained for President Cleveland Parish. Our courthouse dates from 1860. It's one of the oldest public buildings still in use in the state today. The courthouse committee reported the building complete on September 3rd, 1861 at a cost of $12,304.36. Okay, I've gotten a little bit ahead of myself chronologically, so let's go back to the 1820s. The first road through Northwest Louisiana was built in 1828 by Army troops and known as the Military Road. Its purpose was to connect a series of forts built along what was then the southwestern frontier of the United States. This is long before Texas came into the Union. And in fact, what became Texas was then Spanish territory. The western edge of the country, in fact, was a no man's land, the Sabine Strip, inhabited by outlaws who preyed on American settlers crossing over into Spanish territory. The colonial Spanish government in the early days welcomed American settlers. The purpose of the military road was to guard the frontier and also to move troops and supplies back and forth among the forts. It began at Fort Chesa on the Red River, Lower Red River, near Natchitoches, and it ended at Fort Tosu, near the headwaters of the Red River in Oklahoma. Traces of that urban roadbed are still evident in many places in Clayton Parish. It looks like a big, wide ditch. The military road ran by one side of the John Murrow Road. And I also understand that the main street in Ringo follows the course of the old military road. The first census of newly created Clamber was the 1830 census, which enumerated a population of 1,539 whites and 215 blacks. 181 of whom were slaves. Most free persons of color were of mixed racial background, and they lived in the southernmost part of the parish near the Cane River area around Natchitoches. The largest number of white settlers entered Clayton Parish between 1840 and 1860. Those were the years of the land rush. Curiously, Although Northwest Louisiana is known to be Caddo Indian territory, these early settlers never mentioned seeing Caddo Indians. Instead, they mentioned seeing Choctaws, roving bands of Choctaws. The explanation is that the Caddo's, whose numbers were diminished by disease and warfare, had sold their tribal lands to the U.S. government in 1835 and moved away, first to the area around Jasper, Texas, and later on to Indian Territory. For their part, the Choctaws had been pushed off their farming lands in Mississippi by the more aggressive Chickasaws and also by pressure from the westward expansion of flights. So, that by the time white settlers began arriving in the area in large numbers, Choctaws were the only Indians remaining in the area. 
Most of our ancestors came, from, came to Clayton Parish during the 1840s and the 1850s, migrating from older states of the southeast, Georgia and Alabama of the leading states of origin. For the most part, they were of English and Scots Irish descent. With them, they brought slaves of African descent. Most were seeking fresh farmland, having depleted their farmlands back east. The second wave of settlers was more substantial, material, than had been the first or pioneer group. Neither the large plantation nor the small farm was characteristic of Clayton Parish. Most homes fell into the small plantation category of 50 to 500 acres. Although the uplands of Clayton Parish varied considerably with respect to soil fertility, they supported a population of fairly prosperous farmers. By 1860, the percentage of heads of families who owned their land was 82%. Regarding the issue of Louisiana's secession from the Union in 1861, delegates from Flavor Parish adopted a waiting sea attitude, but they voted to secede when the final vote was taken. Ten and one half companies of Confederate infantrymen were mustered in Clayton Parish, not counting the individuals who listed in several cavalry, artillery, medical, and other units. From over here, there were the men in blues and the men in rangers, which was a cavalry unit. And then there were the Clayton Braves and the Clayton Rangers, the Clayton Volunteers, the Clayton Invincibles. Our statue of a Confederate soldier on the courthouse lawn has a metal box in its base that contains all the names of the men of Clayton Parish who served in the Civil War. At home, Clayton Parish served as a refugee center for people fleeing Union held territory. And the people of the parish also cared for large numbers of sick and wounded soldiers. Following the Civil War, we entered the period of radical reconstruction, which was a tumultuous time, during which Webster Parish was created from portions of the three surrounding parishes. And so, Webster began its existence as an independent parish. The lives of the early settlers were not easy, but they still managed to have fun. And sometimes they carried their pranks a little too far and got in trouble. For example, I'm going to share some portions of an 1853 libel suit against one William M. Graham, who was accused of unlawfully, wickedly, and maliciously defaming the good name of William C. Martin. I'll tell you in advance that I don't know the outcome of the suit because I have looked diligently, but I can't find it. Graham, who was a schoolmaster, evidently wrote and caused to be published in the newspaper what he considered to be a humorous poem about his friend Billy Martin. Martin didn't see the humor in the poem and took it to the grand jury who returned the true bill. Graham fled town. So here is the battle of Chicken Bill. <laughs> Good people all, both great and small. Pray listen, if you will. I'll sing a song not very long concerning Chicken Bill. His name says fame, and how it came, I am not very sorry. But in his youth, it is the truth. They called him Billy Martin. <coughs> I now will tell and do as well how Billy got his name. One stormy night, 
it's worn out of sight, into a hen roost came. Upon a tree sat chickens three, close by the owner's house. So up he crept while they all slept, as sly as any mouse. Old Chanticleer, now being near, Bill caught and choked him well. And reaching then to catch a hen, down to the ground he fell. The ground so loud that all the crowd of dogs about the yard took the alarm and dreading harm were soon upon their guard. Upon poor Bill, with right good will, the rooster off his back. The hounds took scent. Away they went, full cry upon his tracks. Just such a race, just such a chase. And I am sure of that. Was never seen beneath the sun by person, cow, or cat. The owner rose, put on his clothes, took down his trusty gun. Being strong and stout, he ventured out, and after them, did run. Away went dogs, on brush and box. Away went chicken bill. The owner followed and cussed and hollered, and swore the thief he'd kill. The neighbors wound, who heard the sound, came running, every one. And each one brought, and sure he owned, his dogs and his own gun. For full six hours, with all their powers, they chased poor Chicken Bill. Each one full bent with strong intent, the animal to kill. His breath came fast. The horn's loud blast proclaimed that death was near. You do it too, son. He dropped his rooster and climbed the tree in fear. About three score and many more of pounds upon his trail. Joined with the sound of men and boys came thundering up the veil. And soon they came up with the game and all surrounded the tree. Next came the men, said Billy Bill, what will become of me? They went to work, each like a Turk, while loud the axes sound, and with a crash, a dreadful smash, the tree fell to the ground. Into the top, the dogs did hop, and seizing the poor man, he screamed so loud that all the crowd cried, save him if you can. With many a stick and many a lick, they beat away the hounds, and found the wretch in woeful plight, all covered o'er with wounds. His race is run, my tail is done. I wish the man no ill. But since that day, go where he may, they call him Chicken Bill. <laughs> <laughs>
pretty much gives a history of our parish. And uh, I would invite you to pick one up and look at it. You'll see things that uh, you might have wondered about or wondered where they went. It goes back into our past. And uh, we're looking forward to visiting your museum tonight. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 